Namaskar, I'm Professor Devdi Purkayasta from IIT Bombay, and I welcome you to my course, Business Fundamental for Entrepreneurs, Part 2, External Operations. This is a guest lecture by Mr. Ashok Balasubramanian, who is the founder and CEO of Open Weaver, and who focuses on leveraging emerging technologies to further the digital space. He has supported clients across the world in North America, Europe, and Asia in their digital transformative initiatives. After his graduation, he did his MBA from IIM Bangalore, and he has served as a global CTO of Atos. So with that, over to Mr. Ashok. Uh, welcome to the module. Uh, uh, glad to be sharing my experiences, insights uh, with you all. Uh, thanks to Professor Devdeep, IIT Bombay, and NPTEL for uh, inviting me for this. Uh, we've got an exciting module uh, ahead of us. Uh, so it's a pretty uh, uh, insightful and uh, engaging topic. Uh, as we all say, you know, the proof of the pudding uh, is in eating. So if you look at this topic, uh, there are two key parts to it. Uh, starting with the bottom part of it that says rapid prototyping. Uh, why rapid? Uh, today's business world is fast. Uh, the sooner that you can create your idea, demonstrate to your user, get feedback, and improve your product. Uh, so rapid, extremely important. And the first half is even more important. Uh, it essentially says winning with customers. Uh, you create a product, and that product is successful if the customer is successful in solving his or her pain point. So extremely important for you to think of, can the customer win with your product? And that's why we coined this module as uh, winning with customers through rapid prototyping. So very exciting topic. Uh, we look forward to share uh, more insights with you. Uh, as we go into this, right, so as we think about rapid prototyping for winning with customers, uh, what's important? Uh, how do you leverage? How do you go about it, right? Uh, there are multiple opportunities ahead of us, and the first opportunity is digital. So the way uh, the industry has evolved, uh, so if you look at it uh, three decades ago or two decades ago, uh, it used to be called as management uh, information services. So uh, there were computers. Uh, there was management, and then the job was uh, you know, getting some weekly reports, monthly reports to management. And then if you're lucky, you had something like, a, like an ATM or a stock trading, which was near real-time uh, transactions. So that was about uh, two decades or thereof, uh, three decades ago. Uh, if you look at the past decade, uh, we said this, this technology, information, uh, is becoming key for everyone. So you could kind of you know, take this information and its technology and give it to everyone. And then you look at last decade, uh, we called it IT or information technology, where the information was available to everyone that executed operations. So all knowledge workers had uh, IT and computers. So we looked at the era of something like an e-commerce, uh, online trading, and so on and so forth. Uh, but if you look at the past decade, uh, things have changed in a, in a very big way. Uh, so look at it today, the way you're looking at uh, this course uh, fully online, the way you probably streamed the World Cup match, uh, the way you probably bought your uh, lunch today, uh, everything is online, you know, everything is online and, and you really cannot separate. Uh, is Uber a business if there is no mobile? Uh, is Zepto a business if, if there is no mobile? So you truly cannot, you know, in this decade of what we coin as digital, you truly cannot separate uh, what is the product and what is the technology from what a business is. So very important as we uh, move into this era of rapid prototyping for winning with customers, uh, for you to think digital first. And when you think digital first, it kind of gives us uh, three large opportunities. First one is it, it deeply embeds uh, the product or the experience with the customer, right? So typically, I think this is a, uh, it's very subtle but very important. Uh, when you typically think of a prototype, you kind of say, bring the customer to the prototype and, and let them do something. Uh, but when you kind of think of it as, as a digital experience, uh, 
uh, you're already on the customer's phone, you're on their device, you're probably on their watch, and so on and so forth. So you're already uh, you're deeply embedded in the customer's workflow. So you don't need to think of, you know, how do I get a customer? Uh, how shall I have her try this? You're already in the customer. So first advantage of thinking of your digital prototype uh, is to make sure that, you know, you're able to be in the customer's uh, workflow uh, or daily activities in, in some sense. Uh, second opportunity that it gives you is, is what is scale, uh, because typically if you look at uh, physical prototypes, you think of standalone prototypes, uh, which are not connected. Uh, they significantly limit the access to the physical market that you can reach. Uh, think of it as a digital experience. Uh, it kind of opens the whole world as a marketplace to you. And uh, in that scenario, uh, even you know, if your product is physical, even if you think it's a, it's a electric vehicle or some sort of a creatine chip that you're making, think of how you can create a user experience for the customer to say, can she check her creatine levels on, on her phone? Can she onboard? And based on those creatine levels, can it recommend diet for her? Can it you know, kind of book a doctor appointment or the next dialysis appointment? So think of how you can gradually expand the boundaries of not thinking of it as an isolated physical experience, but more of a, a fully permeable digital experience, that kind of sets the tone that you know the, the whole world is your marketplace. So second uh, important advantage is, is the whole world is your marketplace. And towards the end, you know, I think we'll go through some demos and, and see how you can leverage digital marketing to kind of get to the whole world as your marketplace. So third part of it, uh, Again, you, know, you could look at it as uh, significant disruptions, uh, but where we, we are startups, right? So disruption is an opportunity, right? So wherever there's a disruption, that is an opportunity for you to change the game. And the disruption of the decade uh, is, of course, generative AI. Uh, so you, there are infinite opportunities opening up in generative AI across, you know, anything from uh, claims processing to a, a digital scribe for a healthcare, uh, all the way to citizen services, uh, from a government perspective where, you know, complex documents can be explained to users. Uh, so there are infinite opportunities across each vertical, each micro vertical uh, that ensures uh, that there is a significant opportunity for you to change the way the world works. So digital, again, embracing digital, uh, like I said, a creatine chip uh, is a physical product. But if you think of it that there is a, a dialysis mentor sitting on the phone, talking to the chip, uh, which is using generative AI to say, hey, if you are uh, a strictly vegetarian, uh, what should you be eating based on your creatine levels today morning? Uh, that kind of you know, increases the, the stickiness of your product uh, with that customer and, and can significantly make you successful. So three amazing things on, on why you should think uh, digital first when kind of, you know, we go through rapid prototyping to win with customers. So those are, those are aspects on you know, how you could go about doing things. Uh, one other critical aspect, I think, of what you, know, you could think differently, and this is based on significant experience, uh, having worked in technology and technology products over the last 25 odd years. Uh, typically in a legacy world, we go and, and uh, we kind of ask the customer, saying, hey, I think you have this problem. Uh, if I do A, uh, will it solve it for you? If I do B, will it solve it for you? If I do C, will it solve it for you? So those are things that you know typically happen when uh, uh, when you kind of you know talk to a customer and and kind of do some sort of a soft research that says, hey, would these things help you? Uh, but there are uh, two inherent challenges there. Uh, you know, we a lot of us come from uh, you know engineering background, idea background. Uh, our communication may not be the best. So what essentially happens is we may not be able to paint that magic to the customer on what he or she is actually going to get. So one, uh, that communication gap of what they're going to get uh, could distort their feedback. So they may uh, infer that you, know, you are maybe giving some idea A, B, C, versus for them, you know, they might have thought it's something else, and then they could give you feedback on based on what they think. So that's one distortion. Second, I think the other biggest mistake that we entrepreneurs do is we talk to people whom we know. Uh, so that's the other mistake, right? So you may get a soft feedback. Someone says, okay, you know, let me not uh, spoil his enthusiasm. Let's, let's say, okay, this may look good uh, and, and something works and it may work. Uh, 
uh, and, and of all people, right? I think Steve Jobs uh, summarized it well. Customer does not know what he wants uh, unless you give them something, you know. Uh, so that's a critical part of it. And again, that's where the prototyping becomes critical. Uh, but even in that concept of prototyping, don't separate the prototype and the customer. Don't say, hey, customer, you are here. And my prototype has feature A, feature B, feature C. Look at it and tell me what to do uh, is where things can go wrong. Uh, what you could do, uh, again, you know, I think these are advantages of digital. Uh, what you could do based on digital is uh, this concept called minimum viable product. What it essentially says, uh, build your prototype to a functioning level. So if you thought of prototype as something that is just clickable, navigable, but does not do something, uh, bring features into it that does something, uh, you know, that does the bare minimum that the customer needs to solve her problem and give it to the customer, right? So instead of saying, hey, customer, this is what I have. Can you look at it and tell me? Uh, we're doing two things, right? Uh, one, we're actually building a product which is uh, as small as possible. And instead of showing it to them, we're giving it to them. And uh, since we have thought digital now, uh, you don't need a, a, any special interface to give it to them. You're going to maybe deploy it in their phone, deploy it in their web browser, and so on and so forth. So it's so easy. So now it becomes more of an observability for us rather than an interview. Now you let the customer use your minimum viable product and, and you can get feedback from them digitally. You can observe them digitally to see what they're doing. And are they able to you know, uh, solve the problem that you intended this product or the service to do? Uh, you can watch it. So extremely, you know, again, a very soft separation uh, but extremely important. So we're essentially saying uh, prototype, absolutely important. Uh, add core functionality to prototype. And instead of demonstrating it to customer, give it to the customer to use it. Let the customer use it to solve the problem. And since we're deploying digitally, uh, you can deploy it into the customer's workflow and get feedback, you know, both direct as well as observable feedback on how she is able to solve the problem. So. Uh, extremely useful concept called minimum viable product in the digital age of how you could you know, rapidly prototype something that is significantly uh, testable. Now, if you look at the MVP approach, uh, what is important here, right? So important is uh, for us to understand uh, what the problem is. Uh, and of course, you know, as entrepreneurs, we set out to solve a problem, uh, but sometimes you know, we get carried away by four or five new ideas that may come in. Uh, so strip the idea to the barest minimum form to say, hey, this is the core idea. And then look at, you know, what is the core person of the user? Uh, you know, who is the user? Because again, uh, if you think about it in six months, 12 months, two years, uh, of course, you might have a, a unicorn idea where you'll have millions of users. Of course, that's there. But today, this week, next week, next four weeks, uh, who would you want to test that core idea with? So that's again a very important part of uh, how you would go about it. Then the third part that comes in is, you know, uh, because we don't want to take too long, right? So we said we want to give something that is functional into the hands of the user, into the digital device of the user, you want to try it. Uh, we absolutely cannot afford in this digital world to take, you know, two months, three months, six months to get that feedback. Uh, we need that feedback in, in one week, two weeks, or whatever time that uh, shortest possible. So think about it in weeks uh, and not in terms of months. Uh, or of course, you know, very long, uh, it kind of loses the flavor and uh, the world changes fastly. And last uh, important point is don't fall in love with the solution. So whatever you created as a solution or a minimum viable product, don't love it. Uh, let's say we thought of a problem that the customer faces or a market opportunity that exists today and we kind of came up with a solution, uh, that solution is just one way of addressing the problem. So of course, you know, I think uh, some may work, some may not work, uh, but feel free that you know, it may not work and you'll be ready to throw it away. So this is a great concept, right? So now if we uh, uh, think of it and say, hey, let's put some boundaries around it. Uh, let's take maybe an example. Uh, uh, and since we said digital and you know, there's so much changing in generative AI, uh, I worked with a few startups uh, who came up with some similar idea. Uh, so you may know an Etsy or an Artsy. So these are all you know, large online marketplaces 
focusing on handmade art and craft. So they essentially bring together, you know, lakhs of artists uh, who will kind of have, you know, maybe some pottery, some art, some drawing, some painting uh, that you can buy online. So group of young folks who were kind of into arts essentially said, hey, you know, uh, we have an amazing idea. We looked at it. We want to reinvent in, in some sort of a modern art perspective. Uh, but we do not have the funding and we do not have the time to build like a marketplace of, you know, maybe few lakh artists who will be kind of, you know, showcasing their painting. Uh, so then, you know, they ideated and said, hey, let's use generative AI because uh, AI can today, you know, paint and draw, right? So think about it. Many years ago, we said the bots will do menial tasks and humans will do imaginative. Uh, this past year has actually shown that bots can actually do a lot of the imaginative. It writes poems, it draws. So this team kind of got, uh, you know, a founding team got excited and said, hey, let's, let's disrupt this market. Uh, let's bring in a concept like what MECD did, right? So MECD said, uh, this is fast customization. So there are pre-built blocks, but you can build your own burger. But it is not a fine dine restaurant where everything is, is cooked from scratch. So there the, they clearly set out the problem that said, there is a one-end high-end art collector market, uh, which will really look at named artists, uh, excellent paintings which are in tens or lakhs of rupees or even much more crores of rupees. Then there is your bottom of the pyramid where you already have pre-printed maybe a few hundred uh, to maybe a few thousand rupees where you know you have pre-printed uh, card stock available that you can use as art. In between they said, hey, let's create a market where the user can describe something and then it solves a problem. So very clear clarity that said, hey, we're going after a market uh, which is willing to pay maybe a few thousand rupees for art. Uh, something that they feel that is a part of you know what they created uh, and something that is customized to their taste uh, but may not have the wherewithal to you know commission a, a real human artist to paint so very good clarity in terms of having saying you know what you're trying to solve what is that part that you're trying to solve and who is that customer who is going to be your test customer for that point of time so now even if you have that clarity that says hey, here, is a, here is a set of customers who are going to you know, benefit from uh, that amazing idea that you have, uh, as entrepreneurs, we again you know, get carried away. We say, hey, beautiful, you know, I have generative AI. I looked up generative AI. Generative AI can do image to image, text to image, voice to image, video to image, idea to image. It can do so many things. I spoke to 50 different people, you know, they said X, Y, Z, someone wants it in this style, someone wants a black and white frame, someone wants a wooden frame, someone wants a canvas. So we all get super excited, right? Uh, so, and, and of course, as startups, that enthusiasm is what keeps us going. So nothing wrong with it, uh, but time, right? So as, as startups, uh, we kind of fail in two things, right? So one is uh, not addressing that market fit quickly, and then, of course, if you don't do it in the right time, you run out of funding. So this whole part of actually winning with customers with rapid prototyping will solve both. Uh, in very less funding, uh, you can create a, a minimum viable product. And by giving that minimum viable product to the smallest customer segment, uh, you will test your market fit uh, very easily. So again, it becomes critical for us to create that uh, most robust uh, prototype uh, in a rapid manner. It is extremely important for us to prioritize features. So we cannot go back and say, you know, there are infinite features that will come out uh, and that may take months to build. So think about what is absolutely the user's need. Uh, so here, our example, uh, where we said there is a generative art and, and maybe let's call it me Picasso. Maybe I, I want to be like Picasso is what we're telling the users that, you know, you are as good as Picasso. So let's say, you know, this me Picasso that's there, uh, it has to test that need, right? And what is that need? The most basic need we're saying is uh, users are willing to pay, right? So willingness to pay is absolutely critical, right? So you want someone to pay for it. And what is it that we want them to pay for? We want them to pay for an art that is generated based on the user's idea, right? So very simple. So if you think of that as the core idea, 
and then we call you know there is a beautiful concept in minimum viable product called needs met criteria so we are essentially saying create a prototype that is functional that will make sure that these needs are met that needs are just two fold one user is willing to pay and two user is willing to pay for some art that is generated based on what the user told to be then beyond that you will have you know many ideas you will say maybe the user will sign on it or maybe the user will see one picture and then you know draw something according to it or maybe the user will speak maybe the user will sing all those things will come later so important part of prioritizing features is is the time scale uh, of course in in 3 months 6 months 12 months everything is important but think about what is important uh, in the next 2 weeks to actually show that criteria that says customer is willing to pay for an art that is generated so that's a very critical way to think about it and uh, we wouldn't go through it in detail here i would recommend you to kind of you know look it up so there are two beautiful you know uh, structured models one is called the moscow matrix uh, and second is called the kano model both are fairly similar i brought both because they bring slightly different uh, flavors uh, moscow is very clinical in the way it addresses it says hey, here is a must have uh, should have Uh, good to have kind of so it it gives you that priority of you know what is absolutely essential and then you will get a, a very clinical analysis to say you know i i had 50 features at this point of time these are the three features that are essential for a customer to absolutely try that uh, core needs met criteria so that's one way to look at it and and that's absolutely correct Uh, but what we also found useful in the kano model is it takes one step further it says absolutely do Uh, what moscow said i think go after the big blocks go after the important ones at this point of time uh, but since these are digital uh, look at what can create user excitement right uh, we want the user to be happy uh, if the user is happy uh, one they should absolutely solve their problem but can you make them excited about solving the problem because there are two ways right you could take them through a very uh, methodical way to solve the problem of course the problem will be solved it will be a transactional success but if you can give them a little bit of joy that says hey uh, my prototype uh, also make them sit back and said wow right so think of our example our example says uh, you know me picasso says uh, the user is going to be an artist so can you motivate them can you tell them saying hey you are now like a world renowned artist they feel happy about it uh, maybe can you do two steps further one you know maybe can they share it on instagram whatever they painted on instagram so that uh, you know their friends will say wow you know you are a great artist and and uh, it also gives you advocacy right because if your first users share it on instagram and said hey i built it on me picasso.com uh, that is going to be you know free advertisement and uh, free word of mouth for you so think of points of joy for the customer where she or he not just solves their problem Uh, but also feels good about solving it and feels good telling someone else that you know their problem was solved with your prototype so about 90 95% spend on the logical grouping spend 5 to 10% in kind of you know seeing if uh, uh, you can bring those features uh, you know that will bring joy or excitement or stickiness uh, to that user so and last important one of course you know customers are our best teachers we learn from customers Uh, but don't shy you know uh, learning from competition i think what worked well for them uh, get inspired by it uh, what didn't work so well for them uh, of course you can plan ahead you don't need to repeat the same mistake you can plan ahead and and fix things from there so while you focus on needs met uh, so this again uh, becomes critical right so think about it uh, we talked on the previous section on on how do you go through it you could use a moscow model or a kano model to go through and and uh, pick your needs met this is another view that that kind of you know pictorially represents and this is where some of us go wrong you know i come from an engineering background i get happy that says hey this product is built on uh, this cloud technology it can scale to millions of users it can it uses uh, some llama model of generation so on so forth right well, who cares the customer doesn't care or it doesn't directly impact the customer's outcome right so so don't think of needs met uh, or your minimum viable product as features that you're using to build the product so let's say for example uh, if you're going to use open weaver studio to build the product 
uh, that is not something that you should tell your customer. Right? You can't tell your customer, I use this technology, so please use my product. I, I don't think they will uh, find use in that. But if you tell them, hey, uh, you can be an artist using this. It solves the need of, of you being an artist. And it solves the need of you exhibiting it. Maybe you can print it and ship it to your home. Or you can share on Instagram. You are able to exhibit it. So needs met criteria are focused primarily uh, on features or experiences that solve the customer's problem and are not based on internal features of a product. So again, think through uh, very deeply here. Many of us go wrong there by spending too much time on how to build something versus what addresses the customer's problem. Uh, you can, of course, build a platform that will you know, scale to lakhs of users maybe in three months, six months. Uh, but if you want to test that idea that says if someone is willing to pay for an art that is generated, uh, use the shortest possible path to get there uh, and, and focus on those two needs. Is someone willing to pay? Is someone willing to uh, draw something through generative AI? And don't spend too much time to say, my UI has this uh, jazzy features. I can drag, drop, do this, do that. My cloud is so secure. It, it doesn't matter in, in, this, in this state. Once you become scalable, uh, once you become super successful, a lot of things will, will make sense. But uh, using the principle we said, right, startups very important, uh, you know, market fit and, and time and uh, money, right? So you want to get market fit with the shortest time and the shortest or smallest budget possible. So these two will kind of, you know, uh, make us stay true to, you know, can I build something quick uh, which will focus on needs met criteria for my user. And uh, you don't need to be too shy about it, right? Uh, because we all say, hey, no, no, I have such a big idea. And unless I build all these things, uh, my customer will you know, just throw my idea away. No, it is not. Uh, and that's where, you know, like we said, uh, look at competition, look at mentors. And mentor doesn't need to be uh, your mentor in an incubator or someone whom you're talking to every day. Mentors can be, of course, industry leaders. So look at uh, what the largest of largest uh, providers and, and digital leaders did. So if you look at uh, Airbnb, uh, their minimum viable product just tested one thing, which said, uh, are people willing to share uh, maybe you know, some part of their home? And is some customer willing to pay for it? Very simple. Website, very simple listing, does not do payment, does not have maps. Uh, users transact separately and it started with just air beds for events which means there is an event that is happening let's say in Mumbai today and uh, if I have a spare bedroom I, I inflate an air bed and I say this is maybe a uh, thousand rupees for a night and then someone does it so super simple right we could have think of it you would have gone all over the place trying to create an amazing website uh, which does so many things not required. So think of minimum viable product and that rapid prototype to say, is customer willing to pay for a shared accommodation? Nothing else, you know. Uh, next, FinTech, you know, our darling Stripe from FinTech, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, inline payments that is there. And, and most of us startups that want worldwide uh, payments use Stripe, you know, so successful. But if you look at their first product or even their minimum viable product that came out, uh, fully manual. Uh, except, uh, you know, it kind of showed them saying, hey, there is a, there is a product that is available. Once you sign up, uh, someone manually onboards you, does the manual integration, and then you're on your own. Uh, but it just tested saying, you know, that uh, there are customers who are willing to pay for alternative inline payments to what typical merchant model that existed at that point of time. So very simple, right? The third one, one of the most uh, customer-centric organizations in the world, Zappos. You know. So at that point in time when people bought books and then Amazon said, hey, you can also buy electronics uh, online, uh, they came out and said, hey, why can't people buy you know, something like shoes? And, and that time the concept was uh, things like shoes and apparel are things that you need to touch, feel, fit, uh, look, feel, all those needs to be there. So people will not buy. So their minimum viable product was very simple, a simple website that listed uh, shoes. Then someone places an order, someone in the back end actually runs to a store, buys the shoe and ships it to you and then you pay for it. So super simple, but 
what did it do? The needs met criteria that essentially said someone is going to pay and buy something that is experiential like a shoe online. So it tested that part of it. So extremely important for you to crystallize uh, your prototype uh, uh, to the smallest factor which makes sure that the user is successful or your hypothesis of how the user is successful is, is met very well. Uh, because that will make sure that if you crystallize it so small, we will be able to launch it in days and weeks and not months, which is critical for any startup to succeed. And of course, I think uh, while we talked about, you know, we'll do it digital, we are going to use uh, generative AI, uh, what becomes critical is, you know, uh, digital has also come along with it. So Zappos, Stripe, these were like five years, eight years back uh, when they were much smaller. Uh, but the concept of minimum viable product is still today true, right? So, for example, uh, this World Cup, uh, I was looking to order, you know, T-shirts for me and my friends on uh, Zepto because the World Cup match has started and we wanted the fan T-shirt. Some of us uh, didn't have it. So, we said, hey, let's look for a large, medium, this size, that size. And uh, uh, if you look at it, each one is a different product. Uh, small is a product, medium is a product, large is a product. Uh, if I had thought of it as an engineer, I would have said, hey, it has to be one product, uh, this style has to be a part of it, a uh, size has to be part of it, then men, women, unisex has to be part of it. I would have imagined and created a very complex solution to it. But think about it, uh, such an amazing leader in quick commerce, they said, hey, no problem, customer wants a shirt, give them three options, they will buy. You don't need to complicate it so much by you know, uh, bringing in 10 options into that buying procedure. So even if it's not, you know, a little bit, a few years older like Stripe, even today you will see minimum viable product in action in, in every part of what you do. Uh, another example from this great product, Zepto, right? So uh, others said, you know, you need to track, you can see the motorcycle coming, you know, next to your street and all. But you go to Zepto, they say, hey, it's Boomra speed, you know, that's all it is. You place your order, uh, they don't expect you to see where the bike is, but they say it comes fast, it comes fast. So. You can always, you know, you don't need to go to the nth feature level. Uh, you can always look at it to say, how can you optimize and, and build with the minimum features. But what good thing that is available in digital today is, is the ability to build an app uh, is much more easier. And that's what we'll see in the, in the demo as well of how we can actually easily build a product uh, using OpenViewer Studio. Uh, but even when you build, you know, even if the product allows you to build something easy, uh, there are some critical considerations for you. You really need to think through in terms of, you know, the whole user experience. Uh, and uh, essentially they say a human's attention span is, you know, anywhere between a few seconds to about seven seconds, right? So in that seven seconds, you have to kind of, you know, get the user to say, okay, I looked at it, okay, I want, I think I may find it useful. Uh, and then that seven seconds, if they like what they see, uh, maybe they will invest maybe, 60 seconds with you. And then if they see something good in that 60 seconds, maybe they'll invest uh, 20 minutes on your product. So that idea that, you know, uh, that user experience, that customer journey, that message structure and call to action, which essentially says you can't tell the customer I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G at one shot. They'll say, it's too complicated, I don't have time. But if you say, hey, I have A and B, which is most important, they say, wow, let me see. Then you say, by the way, there is, uh, C, D, and E, and then once they get invested into it, tell them there is X, Y, Z also. So take steps, you know, that's extremely important in that uh, message structure and call to action. And then supporting things, right? I think uh, being digital today, you know, you can reach a larger scale. Uh, softer things in terms of, you know, your, your brand elements, if you choose a color, you know, do you associate with the color? Uh, do you associate with a certain imagery? Uh, hierarchy, all these messages cannot be at, at one level. So you can say this is message one. Okay, if you got it, here is message two, then here is message three. Uh, extremely important. And, and we'll kind of look at this in a, in a quick demo of how we could build this product. Uh, our prototype, what we said is uh, me Picasso, which is going to be a, a generative art, generative product. Uh, which customers will buy, you know, their custom art out of, uh, using a, a design-first uh, no-code tool from OpenViewer Studio. So we said we'll create, uh, you know, our uh, rapid prototyping for our idea, right? So me, Picasso, which is a, 
generative art product that users are going to use to you know build their own custom art uh, and buy it online right so uh, part of the course uh, you can sign up for your uh, free trial uh, at studio.openweaver.com so you go ahead and create new which means uh, let's say we create uh, our product So you get a cool interface uh, where you can, you know, uh, kind of create uh, your product. And what did we say? We said, uh, you know, you need to look at form factor, you need to look at design elements and so on and so forth. Uh, so most of the digital technology and the only reason that we started OpenViewer was to make sure that, you know, things are easy for people to build. Uh, these support, you know, all form factors are native, so you don't need to worry about, uh, you know, uh, do I build it uh, for a mobile, do I build it for a web application and so on and so forth. So it becomes kind of you know easy for you to uh, build any product that works on all form factors. So to some degree you know we definitely want to brand right. So we want to say hey this is my product. So you will kind of put an header that says you know this is what my company is and so on and so forth. Uh, you can uh, generate your logo also and, and we'll come to it you know we'll talk about it uh, when we go to the generative AI part of it a lot of tools today you know will help you build your logo online as well and what do we want to do in this product uh, we uh, want to call this as uh, you know maybe our home page so the first page for me Picasso is our home page uh, and in this page we want to keep it simple we don't want to confuse the users with too many things so let's take out, you know, for the prototype, maybe we don't need the user to sign up. Uh, we don't need the user to sign in and all that stuff. So let's get rid of whatever is not critical. Maybe we don't have a product also. We just have a service called uh, the generative. So let's say that's a service. Uh, then what do we want to do? We said we want to kind of excite the user. We want to show them something that says, you know, I am excited about what is uh, here. So that concept is called as a hero section in a product. It's called a hero or a welcome message that essentially sets the mood uh, for the user, right? So you can drag drop and put in a hero section that says, uh, what is it that you want to communicate about your product to the user, right? So we say, So we're essentially, you know, motivating the user. We're saying, hey, you can be a Picasso as well, because we said, hey, uh, there is only uh, seven seconds, and in that seven seconds, of course, you know, you will have better ideas than me. But think about uh, what is that uh, first call to action. You're saying, hey, you, we are going to bring out the Picasso in you, and then maybe, you know, you can explain it a little bit. Some people may not understand it fully, so you could kind of, you know, uh, explain it by saying. Um, Let's say you can imagine it's a new keyboard, so I'm kind of, you know, <laughs> it's taking a bit of trials. Imagine uh, paint showcase. So we're essentially saying the user, saying, hey, you imagine and it paints and you can showcase it. So we're actually telling them a little bit because if you don't understand it very clearly, we're telling them you can do that also. Uh, maybe at this point of time, maybe if you have a demo, you can show a demo or let's say we want the user to try, right? Because uh, uh, in digital, in seven seconds, you're telling, hey, you can bring out the Picasso in you and, and why don't you try it? Because trying is what we want uh, people to do in the prototype. So let's say, you know, we call this as try now. And uh, like we talked earlier, uh, you can, of course, you know, if you have any brand elements, if you feel, you know, purple is your color, uh, you can copy this and then, you know, define custom themes where you can define your color models, your color palettes, uh, your fonts. Because sometimes, you know, I think people uh, respond to some of these uh, implicit things uh, pretty well too. Uh, so then maybe what? Uh, let's say you're on the page and then uh, we're telling the user saying you can do 
you can do it, right? But not all users uh, respond to it, right? So this is your happiest path where you're telling the user saying you can try uh, generative art, but maybe some users like to scroll. They like to see, okay, what does it mean, right? Uh, what would it look like? So maybe there you can show some proof, right? You can maybe show uh, some things. You can say, you know, uh, some samples that says uh, trending art. So you're saying, hey, there is trending art from this week, which essentially tells them that you know someone has built something, uh, someone has painted something like this to you. Of course, you can change these pictures based on what people will do. Uh, you can say, you know, uh, from amazing. Uh, so that way, again, you're reinforcing. You're telling, hey, these are people like you. These are not, you know, uh, Picasso or you know some some famous painter. These have been painted by painters like you. So, so again, look at the message hierarchy. We kind of put in a header to kind of say, hey, what is the brand about? So that people know that there is a company called Me Picasso and so on and so forth. Then you directly get to the message. You're saying uh, you're meeting that need that makes everyone an artist and they can try it immediately. And of course, softer things. You're actually showing them some examples that says, you know, uh, uh, how you can paint. And, and this is almost there, right? I think uh, it's almost there for most people. But some people may say, you know, OK, uh, I may not want to paint right now. Maybe later, you know, uh, I like the idea, but I'm not going to do it now. Maybe you give them some sort of a subscription that says, you know, you could sign up now and, and kind of watch it. So maybe if you wanted to paint today, but, you know, you didn't have time or uh, you kind of didn't understand it well, you need to go somewhere. Uh, you can join a mailing list. So if you look at it, uh, we created the first slice of you know what we call the prototype, maybe the the marketing version of prototype. You can hit uh, you know preview at any point of time, and if you hit deploy, it goes live. So if you hit preview, uh, it kind of shows your uh, you know application uh, on what it is. So this is available to you. It's available to you know you can share it with all of your uh, users as well. And uh, it is fully responsive, which means you know you, users can look at it on their phone, users can look at it on you know a, any device that they want. Uh, it kind of works on all form factors that you know users may end up using. And what it does right now, it says uh, uh, here is a product, here is what you can do, uh, here are some examples. And at this point of time, if you just want to keep in touch, subscribe. Right. So three simple things it does. Uh, but we still need to do our important thing, right? Our important thing is uh, seeing if the user can paint uh, using generative AI and if the user will buy it from you, right? So those are what we call as our needs met criteria. So right now we have created the connection with the user saying, hey, why should you try this product? Now we will create that step where they can try the product. So since we created a, a common header, uh, you know, I can just duplicate this page. It will create a, a copy of the page. Um, and let's say, let's call this page, you know, on what the user will do. Let's call it paint. So this is where the user will paint. So for painting, we don't need this section. We don't need the user to, you know, kind of uh, go through the hero section. We don't need this. We don't need subscribe because the user is going to paint here, right? So the user is going to paint uh, that generative image that they want. Uh, here you can select if you want something small, if you want to create a low fidelity prototype, you can select from here. But let's say we want the user to you know, directly get into the product and paint. Uh, let me pick a, a generative AI template for image generation. So this is something that will help them paint, right? So, so it tells them saying, hey, if you type something here, uh, that picture will come here. So this again is at, at that uh, static prototype level. There is text, there is input, but nothing will happen so far. And uh, then what do we want to do? We maybe want to kind of, you know, make sure that uh, the user uh, is able to kind of, you know, uh, also buy it, right? We said uh, two things, the user has to paint and the user has to buy. So maybe we'll create a very simple experience for the user to buy. Maybe we'll take an 
order form and, and tell the user to buy it from us, right? Uh, so it says, hey, this is the painting you can buy from us. So again, still at a static prototype level. So if you preview this page, uh, it essentially says, hey, there is uh, me, Picasso, uh, it has services, and uh, they have something to generate an art, and you can buy. But the customer cannot use it right now. It still is at that prototype, comma, customer model. It, you kind of show it to them, and uh, they cannot buy right now. But they can, of course, give you comments that says, hey, I didn't understand this. Uh, I wanted something else on second page, and so on and so forth. Uh, so now let's make it a navigational prototype. So right now, if you look at it, these are like static pictures. You could have drawn it on hand, you could have drawn it on PowerPoint, on Canva. We drew it on uh, OpenWeaver. Now let's make it clickable, right? So we want to connect the flow. So let's say when you click on services, we uh, want to connect it to the next page, right? So we want it to go to the page called Paint, and it opens in the same tab. Maybe when the user clicks on try now, we want to do the same thing. On click of the button, uh, we want to go to that page. So on click of the button, we're saying, hey, user, uh, navigate to page and go to paint. And then in paint, let's say user clicks on home, uh, you want them to come to home, right? So this is done. So now if you maybe let me get excited and deploy it, right? So let's say I want to deploy it. So this URL is globally available. So if you kind of create, and if you're trying it at home, you hit this URL, you'll be able to see this application. So now I click on services. It takes me to this service, and I have a full prototype where I can say, you know, generate, uh, I can submit, I can buy, or I want to go home. I can do all these things, right? <coughs> But still, it is a, what we call as a static prototype. I think on home, we said same tab. Okay. So now the flow is there. The users can you know, uh, kind of uh, go through it. Uh, users can uh, uh, navigate, understand what your product does, uh, come back, look at what others did, joining your mailing list, so on and so forth. Now we need to add the magic behind it, right? So we want to make sure, because this is what we said is okay. It's a great first step. You created an amazing prototype for, you know, something that is uh, going to reinvent a market like, you know, uh, HC or RC uh, in a very large way. But it is still uh, what I call as a navigable prototype or a interactive prototype. Let's take it to a minimum viable product uh, in next few minutes so that the user can uh, use it and, and maybe even buy from it, right? So what do we need to do that, right? Uh, we need the generative technology for that, right? So what is there? We said we want to add something called uh, user uh, gives a text and you want to create an image. So let's add something called as a text image. And what the no-code platform does, it makes it so easy. So instead of having to you know, uh, engineer for months together to add generative AI to your application, we just hit plus, it gets added. And uh, you can do some magic with it, right? So we said, hey, we wanted to create a logo because we didn't have a logo. I wouldn't digress too much, but I just wanted to show. For your startup, you can, you, your prototype idea, you can do that. You can say, create a square logo. So you can say something like this, you know, and, and it generates for you. Uh, and you can save the image, and, and of course, you know, I think uh, traditional uh, transactional systems are faster. Uh, once you generate, uh, it has to go back. So it's created a beautiful logo for you. You can actually save this logo uh, and then use it uh, you know, in that page header. So this can become you know, your startup logo. You can tell it to do anything. You can say, put the text in it for me, do something for me. It'll do all those for you, and you can create. Uh, but that's not the fun. Let's focus on the user's need met, right? We're not focusing on our, our vanity of uh, what our logo looks like. So let's say we added this resource, and this resource is going to be used by the user, and the user is going to paint something uh, for herself and, and you know, buy it of you. 
So we need to create some logic, right? So when the user uh, wants to paint something, we create a logic that says, let's call this image gen flow. Uh, so this flow is what is going to trigger, which is going to you know do that backend uh, magic uh, that is going to create that uh, image for you. Uh, to create the image, what do we need? We just need one simple technology called uh, text to image. Anyway, we added it in the resource. Uh, like all easy technology, you can just drag and drop and, and it comes to you know your uh, screen. So we're saying once the user starts, uh, we need to generate an image and using the text that the user inputted and you're done. You give it back to the user and then she will buy it in that order form that we created. So first simple step, we are saying, hey, which page we want it from? We want it from the page called paint. In that page called paint, uh, she is going to enter the input. And the moment you select a one page called paint, it gives you what all is there. We, these are from the order, the delivery address. We don't need delivery address for generating the, the image. Maybe once you want to kind of you know, get to the uh, get to the order, you can use the delivery address, but let's keep it simple, you know, we can delete uh, whatever is not required. Uh, so we'll just use the text input that the user gave, uh, the prompt input 54, which is what the user going to type saying, hey, this is the picture that I want. So you have that picture and then you just need to pass it to the text to image. We're saying, I want to do text to image and the data is coming from the page input called input 54. And of course, uh, as you do it in a uh, slightly longer, you spend uh, two, three hours, you can actually give right names to it, so it is easy for you. Uh, for want of time, I'm just using the default names that are there. You're saying that is the input, and output automatically comes. You don't need to do anything. And then at the end, what do you want? You want that output. So you took the user's input 54, you sent it to the algorithm that generates the picture, and then you need to send it back to the user. So at end, you're going to say, I need a global variable. That image that the user created from this action called text to image should be available to me at the end. So that's all. So now the logic has created you know, that back end. Uh, we just need to stitch it to the front end. From the front end flow, we need to make sure that you know, you're able to uh, generate it uh, from what the user says. So what have we not done? When the user clicks on this, we need to trigger that action, right? So when we said, try now, we said, go to this page. In this page, when the user creates generate image, we are going to say, you know, uh, on click, uh, execute a flow. And what is the flow we created? We created a flow called image gen flow. So when the user clicks on this, uh, this button, it is going to trigger that nice small logic that we wrote in the back end that says call generative AI and take that input 54 that the user gave, uh, which is this, right? So this is called input 54, the input 54 that the user gave and generate that picture. So now it is doing that. So the picture needs to come here, right? So currently if you look at it, it is a, it's a nice picture, but it is still a, a static picture. So we want the user's image to come here. So let me give it a, a title as well, your image here. And let me remove the static picture and make it dynamic. So we want it to come from the back end. So we make it dynamic. Uh, we select a flow output. And this flow is called image and flow. And we use the data from there. We are all done. Uh, so we created a page, uh, the home page with a marketing message uh, that says, you know, this is what you can do if you click try now. Uh, it will take you to the page. It shows you what others have done. If you're interested, you can subscribe. And if you go to the next page, we said you can unleash what you do. And if you type something here, your picture will come here. And you can order from here and it will reach home, right? So simplest uh, technology. Uh, hit deploy. Uh, your full application uh, is ready. So let's say, you know, uh, I'm the user. I say, wow, I want to bring the Picasso in me. Uh, let's say I want to try now and uh, I want to be Zen-like. So let's say so that's the art that I want to create. So 
So let the let the generative AI digital technology work for you. Uh, it goes out. It starts looking at you know different things, and uh, it creates a beautiful, unique image. So this image is uh, absolutely unique. You can't get it anywhere in the world. So this is created for you. So as a minimum viable product, we said this is what it is. Later, you know, when we said uh, prioritizing needs met, you can add. You know, you can add modifications. You can add signatures. You can add swatches, colors, so on and so forth. And the user can say, "Hey, I this is ABC. Ship it to my home and hit submit. They will buy the product from you. So you're all set in terms of you know. Uh, we created a, a a nice high fidelity prototype. We added the base needs met criteria of having a, a generative AI that generates art, and we also had the needs met criteria that uh, this art can be delivered to the user and they can pay for it." So we kind of went out and created a, a cool little minimum viable product that the user is able to use. So now you have to think in terms of customer feedback. You know, I think uh, uh, so. We spent a lot of time and energy in creating that minimum viable product. And where we all go wrong is we say, "Man, I created something amazing." That's what I told you before we started. Do not love your solution. Love the customer. Love the customer's problem. There will be many other ways to solve it. So. Expect the first thing to fail, you know. I, like we launched uh, this me Picasso site in 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 a few minutes, customer might say, "Hey, I don't understand," or maybe I wanted to speak and it has to draw, or you know, I wanted to pay online, or you know, something. You know, you may get a lot of feedback. So expect uh, multiple iterations possible. Uh, launch to the smallest uh, segment, right? Because sometimes that's something that we do very wrong also. We get so excited because now with this platform that you have access to, you you can launch something. It is available global. So many of us do that mistake that says, "Hey, I created an MVP. Now let me send it to you know fifty thousand people." Then it becomes very difficult for you because fifty thousand people say different things because each of them may come from a different persona. So maybe find you know maybe the first hundred people from a very clear persona that you have mapped, and then get feedback from them. You know I think as your first few iterations of product. it is extremely important for you to do that and with each iteration measure saying is the customer's feedback improving and is the customer succeeding because for us succeeding is customer has to generate more images customer has to add to delivery for all those images that means they're successful so one of course the feedback keeps coming in but then you have to look at the needs met criteria that says how many customers have actually uh, generated and how many have actually placed the order which will actually give you a good idea of what it is and at at very early stage it's good for you to have few thousand customers that love the product than maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of visitors who don't understand what your product is so extremely important for you to kind of you know scale gradually uh, as you succeed because in a digital product it is easy to open out to a lot of people uh, but opening out a, a a product that does not meet the needs uh, is not a desirable outcome for us right the last thing is uh, as you scale so now let's say we created an amazing minimum viable product uh, you know it's it's good with a few thousand users now take the next step of going to the the tens of thousands of users or customers uh, who may love this idea so there we have found digital marketing to kind of you know uh, as the product is digital digital marketing also is amazing uh, so think about social uh, social gives you again you know you will find user groups so for example you will find uh, Uh, art appreciation group uh, in in maybe a, a, a age segment or in a geographical segment you can join that group and and put a message saying here is an amazing service or product that i have uh, you can you know find uh, some people who are willing to do crowd testing for you also and uh, most important uh, you can expect advocates from there so like we said earlier if someone says i generated this meditating buddha in front of a temple Uh, if someone shares it and says hey this is uh, built on me picasso you will get your next 1000 customers directly so you can use uh, social media for getting your customers uh, for getting crowd testing as well as you know for word of mouth advertising from your first set of customers then also look at other angles uh, you can look at you know maybe doing knowledge articles because in digital marketing one of course uh, you will directly promote your product you can also indirectly use you know content you can write blogs you can write newsletters to say you know uh, in 2024 these are the art trends that are there can you you can create art using trends like these 
you can use YouTube to run a video channel to show, you know, maybe the uh, top 100 arts that's been created on your product, you can show to, you know, users who can get excited to say, how did it do? So you can do a lot of those uh, surrogate content-led uh, marketing as well to scale your product to, you know, next tens and hundreds of thousands of customers. So we looked at, you know, a good concept that says, uh, you know, uh, rapid, very important uh, because our runways as startups are short and winning with the customer because uh, if the customer does not win, uh, our product or service does not win. And then we looked at it to say, you know, how do you, uh, you know, use the digital way to create uh, a rapid prototype or what is called as a minimum viable product where you can actually give it to the customer and make them succeed uh, using Open Weaver Studio. Uh, I would recommend all of you to kind of, you know, create your trial ideas while you go through the course and, you know, take your product to the first thousand customers as well as, you know, the next lakhs of customers and, and win with the customer. So all the very best and talk to you soon. Cheers. Bye-bye.